I really was impressed by that. And it, it's just a reminder to me of how we should treat, like you were saying earlier, how we should treat each other. It goes back to the basics of what we were raised to do. And um, it's simple. And yeah. I really like that they impressed upon you guys to have compassion, show that compassion, and just to remind you, etiquette. See, this is tips on BC NBA mines and booby traps. You got a little thing like that. And this is the enemy in your hands. And this is how, this is the uh, enemy in your hands. And it's kind of like the code of conduct book on how you're supposed to treat Vietnamese. Uh, that may, yeah, oh, there, it's hard to read. It, and, and pull it back. And, then, and on the back, it says, the enemy in your hands. Handle him firmly, promptly, but humanely. That's the first thing. This is tips on how you're supposed to handle them. Love it. And this is a malaria thing. I carry malaria. This is about the malaria pill. I carry malaria. It's about the mosquitoes and what you're supposed to do to protect yourself against malaria. So you wow. got all these little things, and this is like... I think this is my shot record. Wow. And if you look, if you look, this is on the back. These are all the shots that when you're in Vietnam, you got tons of shots. And before you went over, you got lots tons of shots. shots. Lots of shots for lots of different things. So wow. you had your shot record that you kept with you. You were given all these different things here. There was even a little pamphlet on things to do under nuclear biological and chemical warfare wow they probably prepare you for everything they did and of course this is my my driver's license that shows i know how to drive a quarter ton three quarter ton and two and a half ton that you learned and you were I able to drive vietnam. i couldn't drive before i got to vietnam but i learned to drive all those things we will talk about that too <laughs> because i have that down as, as questions there too so I, I think all of that is fascinating and this is definitely something that to be able to have the visuals is it makes it real it really does and so thank you for having been able to capture all of that and keeping all of that information that's just phenomenal yeah uh, I don't know how I just you know I you have this stuff placed away for years and years I probably hadn't pulled this out and before a while, I'm 40 years or more. Wow. wow. You know, it just sits down in the box or something. and That's where it is. Wow. I'm glad that you were able to pull it out, and I'm glad that you're able to share this with others. Yeah, I was surprised I had so much, really. <laughs> That's awesome. But, but my dad was one, and I'm one to where you save everything. I mean, I have tons of stuff because you just, you saved everything. Yeah. You didn't throw it away. That, uh, the same it's hard because sometimes you do have to throw things away but those yeah. kind of things you just don't please share with us what a typical day looked like as a communication receiver well when i first got into uh, uh cameron bay and then went to tonsadu and was transferred or went to fulam which was my primary base uh, Fulam is a very big signal communications uh, operation outside of Saigon. It's very big, and they had a very big comm center. Well, I was only there for about a month, and then I was transferred to Long Bend, which had its own little, I showed you a picture of what was in the comm center, microwave equipment, fixed station receiver equipment. And there were uh, probably just maybe 15 or so 15 to 20, no more than 20, maybe just 15 Americans, five Koreans and five Australians on the site. And we had a comm center with a 300 foot microwave tower. We had a generator that, that you had uh, that kept running, we kept the place cool for the equipment. But your day was pretty much, uh, we had 12, 14 hour days, seven days a week. So if you weren't working in the comm center, you were doing things like sandbag duty, you were on guard duty or patrol, or uh, you had duty at night from eight to eight in the morning, uh, guard duty. Uh, you were always busy doing something, pretty much. We just had one barracks mm -hmm. that was open air barracks. 
we had like a Quonset hut type thing to where we had our meals uh, and entertainment stuff like that. And we had a, um, a little place where we could take showers, but a lot of times we didn't want to take a check because the diesel fuel got in the water mm -hmm. and it was not great. We'd almost rather shower outside when it rained than shower in the air. But mm -hmm. yeah, the, the total site was as big as maybe two and a half to maybe three football fields. I'll say it's how big it was. We had four bunkers in each corner, two towers. We had a, uh, a guard house, a little guard house at the front of the gate where you came in because the place was secured. And we had three rolls of concertina wire all around and Claymore mines set out. And we did have a bunker for our ammo. We put a little bunker together for our ammo. And we did build a bunker for ourselves outside the barracks after the barracks got hit with a, a 122 rocket. Um, so it really wasn't very big. But the main thing, the mainstay was the comm center with all the equipment in it. And the Koreans had their equipment, the Australians had their equipment, Americans had their equipment. That was for communications throughout Vietnam. You had the main facilities like Fulong and then the little ancillary sites like the receiver site to keep communications and they were spread out throughout Vietnam. Yes. Do you and think that the equipment for the others were looked the same? I mean, I know that you probably didn't get to see what some of the other bases looked like, but do you think that the Koreans and the, you know, the other people? The Australians? Yeah. They had yeah. different type of equipment. They had a little bit different type of equipment, but it would do basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. I and mean, when we had that 300 foot microwave tower to communicate and the Koreans could use it, the Australians could use it, we could use it. Yeah. So it was pretty similar. It's just they, they had communications with their units, you know, because they're separate. They're our allies. Mm -hmm. And they have their own uh, communication uh, things that they had to do. And we have ours. Koreans had theirs. Of course, we're allied forces, but everybody had to have their own equipment. Yes. Uh, and we did share a lot of information together, but you had different units. Like, you know, the Koreans had the rock units, which were feared by the Vietnamese. These were it's like the, Vietnam, the uh, Korean infantry. They were really strong and they were, they were terrifying to the Vietnamese. Mm. Uh, and then, of course, you had the American forces as well. And the Australians had some groups as well. That's interesting. And it's interesting that you, you knew the difference between your communication system and theirs. That's, that's cool that you guys had that knowledge at that point in time with the differences that were available. Please tell us more about the elephant grass and what did you have to do to get rid of it? Well, elephant grass grows, especially during the rainy season, gets really high. And if you wanna have a field of vision uh, outside your compound, because that stuff would grow like crazy, we would burn it with diesel fuel or put Agent Orange on it to kill it. And you wanted a, a uh, and we would set out trip flares that could go off at night. And a lot of times rabbits or deer would set those things off, but they were set out there to where if any VC were creeping up on you and they knocked off one of those, tripped one of those flares, the flare would shoot up in the air, put a lot of light and from the tower, you could see out there if there was anything. The flares were put out, I'm just trying to remember correctly, maybe a hundred yards or something like that from the uh, site and we would try to maintain or keep that grass cut for, and I don't remember specifically or not, I'm just saying a hundred yards because I think that's a good vision that you can have. So at nighttime, if one of them went off, we used to have a rifle with a starlight scope on and you could point that rifle out there and you could see what was out there. If it was a deer, a rabbit or whatever, and you could call down to the comm center. You were supposed to report every time a trip flare went off where it was, what vicinity it was in the compound, from the compound, and if you saw anything like, yeah, it was a deer, it was a rabbit that set it off, or who knows what set it off, but there's was nothing to report. You didn't see any VC or anything out there. And that, that's, uh, that's really neat. I like that. Um, one of the times that you all were mowing down the elephant grass, you all happened to mow over something. 
what was it you all mowed over? It was a big boa constrictor. And the guys <laughs> brought it back into the compound so we could see it. And they, they had a, uh, a small dozer, I guess, where they were dozing down some of the elephant grass. And they ran over a boa constrictor. And they brought that in to show it to us that that was out there in the field. So, yeah, there were always lots of snakes, boa constrictors, crates, which they call step and a half snake, snake uh, which were small with uh, black and white bands around them, kind of like a coral snake, but the colors were black and white, and it's called a crate. And they were very dangerous. And there were, and there were of course, um, cobras. Yes. Yes, we will talk about that here soon. You also mentioned that everyone had to take turns doing guard duty. What was it like and how often and how long were your guard duty shifts? Well, guard, we had two towers, one in the front that was a lot smaller or high, not as high, but the one in the back was very high tower. And you'd have guard duty from eight at night to eight in the morning for eight hours. And for eight hours. And... Uh, or is that right? Maybe it's more. I'm sorry. From eight to eight, it was maybe more like uh, it's like twelve hours, isn't it? So twelve hours, from eight at night to eight in the morning. So you were up there for, I guess it was twelve hours, right? Eight mm -hmm. to eight, which is a long time. And uh, everybody was assigned guard duty. You know, just it went around. Uh, you even had the Australians had to pull it, the Koreans pulled it, you know, we pulled it, everybody did it. Everybody had to do guard duty. And from eight to eight. And of course that was every night. And you pulled it as much as well if you had 25 guys or so there and you had two that had to do it. So you had to do it maybe every two or three weeks, I guess, when you had guard duty. And you'd get a half hour break to where somebody from the comm center would come up to the tower and you could go down and go into the comm center for a half hour. And our favorite thing was to cook spam, a spam sandwich. We had a little iron in there and you could cook spam and make a spam sandwich, eat that, and then you went back up on guard duty. You, you know, I don't know if our kids anymore know what spam is. <laughs> yeah, that was the greatest thing in the world, make a spam sandwich. <laughs> so we make spam sandwich, eat that, and then go back up on guard duty. And the guy that relieved you for a half hour came back down. Now, well, that's the thing too. Like when you are on guard duty, I mean, you had to go to the restroom, or you know, you get thirsty. I'm sure you took a canteen. You would up call there. down. You'd call down to the comm center, and somebody would come up and relieve you. Whoever was on duty that night, you know, so that comm center was 24 hours. Yes. 24-hour operation. You either had day duty or night duty. I, I got to wear, and you had a person that was a trick chief, called trick chief. And as I was there a little bit longer, I became a trick chief. And maybe I had night, uh, had to work at night for eight hours or whatnot in the comm center. Mm -hmm. And I was a trick chief, which means I was in charge. And, okay. you know, you had an Australian that was working there, the Korean that was working there and maybe yourself and one other person or just yourself. But it was now, 24 hour operation. When you were up in the tower all that time, what were some of the things that you would do to kind of pass the time? Yeah, it all depends on who was uh, the lieutenant at the time. We had one lieutenant that would allow us to listen to the radio. Mm -hmm. And then we had another lieutenant one time that did not allow us to listen to the radio, just had to sit up there. And to me, when you didn't have a radio, it was great when you thought of something to think about. Yes. You just tried to sit there and think of things. I get up, walk around, look around. I mean, it, to be honest, it was very hard. Mm -hmm. It was very hard, even when they had a radio. I mean, the radio was great. You could look to American Forces Vietnam. You listened to that station. And they played music. And their commercials were about booby traps and taking your pill and aren't where you would go on R&R &R and things like that. You know, you saw the movie with Robin Williams where yes. he was the, and it was kind of like that. Yes. Um, it was crazy. I mean, they would come on and say, you know, uh, in the morning they might say, you know, that birds are still chirping, sun's shining. And other than a few little skirmishes last night, everything's just fine. Say something like that. 
<laughs> so, you know, with Robin Williams, Good Morning Vietnam, and you being able to experience hearing that radio uh, celebrity, I guess you would say celebrity or spokesperson at that time, like to be able to connect and have that experience and then later be able to see that movie. I, I imagine that that resonated with you. Yeah, it did. I mean, I, I have, I did, I taped some of the American Forces Vietnam radio during the day, or I taped a session and I have them where they're talking about, you know, watch out for those booby traps or be sure to take your own area pill or where are you going to go on R&R, &R, you know, go to Taipei or you go to Australia or Hawaii. There were several places that you could go for, I remember it was a week or two. And uh, that's what was predominantly on there. And they played, of course, the latest tunes and stuff. And uh, one funny thing I remember, I remember when Jeannie C. Riley came out with Harper Valley PTA. Oh, yes. That was really popular with the black guys. They wow. would they would all the time request that song. And the American Forces Vietnam guys that were doing the broadcast were amazed by it. You know, they just couldn't believe wow. it that they wanted to hear Harper Valley PTA <laughs> by Jeannie C. Riley. <laughs> wow. That that's pretty interesting. I wonder I wonder why. And by the way, I now from our conversation the other day to now, I was trying to think of, of that spokesperson, that radio DJ, it was Adrian Cronauer. Oh, was that it? Was, that was his name, is Adrian uh, Cronauer. I, I couldn't remember, but but that that is his name. Oh, yeah, I do have that CD with the music on it, yeah. Yeah, that, that's so I'll cool. have to listen to it and let that maybe get you a copy of that. I, I would love that if you have that opportunity. That would yeah, be wonderful. I'll listen to it and see what's on it. <laughs> sure, that's what, I think that's what it is. He just yeah, copied. Some of us did that. I mean, there was nothing else to do there. Like I said, you were there for on that receiver site, and once in a while you'd get a day or two day pass, but you're there day in and day out, and you're working for 12 to 14 hours, and it get monotonous. That's why we just think of crazy things to do. Yes. You know, it's just just to just keep up our morale time. and keep going. I mean, it, it would get very depressing at times, really, really depressing at times, really bad. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it, 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 I can imagine, I am only can imagine what it, it, you know, that time just lagging on. You said that your tower was 300 feet high and the Vietnamese would sometimes try to hit it. Did anyone ever get hurt when they were in the tower? Uh, not in the tower, no. We we had, uh, the barracks was hit by 122. We had one guy's name was V.C. Wilder, a black guy. He got wounded. He got some shrapnel in his back, and he got a Purple Heart for that. And that's what we built the, uh, we built the uh, bunker right by the barracks. So if and when we did get other strikes or they hit, we could run out of the barracks into that bunker because we didn't have one next to us. And we put two barrels, two barrels high, all the way around, filled with dirt around the uh, the barracks. That was around the barracks and we had a bunker so we could run into it when shells started coming either out in the compound or once in a while, like I said, they'd hit inside. Now you gotta remember, like I said, they're, they're shooting these rockets from 20 miles away, 10 to 15, 20 miles away. And they're trying to hit a target that's big as maybe three football fields. Mm -hmm. But what they're guided by is they can see that tower. And they just point them at that tower and try to lob them in on us. Mm. They didn't go past and hit your base that much, did they? No. Once in a while, uh, a rock would come inside the compound. Like I said, one time, one hit the barracks. Yeah. And when I was there, one came in the compound. And... I showed you the pictures of me holding pieces of it. Yes. And most of the time they hit outside the compound, mm -hmm. you know, all around the compound, because that was a hard target to hit. Well, and I, I think that's great that you, your base was the way it was and um, that it was so big. And, and that was, I think that was beneficial to you guys as well. Um, you also said that you all would have to set out the flares. We talked about that. Please describe to us what that was like and how often you would have to do that. 
Uh, I do have a picture of us setting out trip flares with me and I think three or four other guys are setting out the trip flares. I got a picture of Gary Holmes was his name, setting one down and I'm showing me out in the field because I'm kind of out there. So I have a 45 with me and uh, that guy named uh, Bill Oatmer was out there with us and Parks was out there and you went out and you reset them as they went off. I mean, if two or three went off, of course, you needed to go out and reset them because somebody could sneak up, up, sneak up on you. And if you don't have a trip flare there, then there's no alarm. Mm -hmm. So as they went off, it was maybe like two, three or four, whatever. Uh, then I think weekly, of course, we went out and replaced those as needed. Like, you know, you also said the mines were there. I was thinking about that when you guys would have to walk and set up the flares was that ever a problem for you all? Well, you just didn't go out on a, a uh, when a thunderstorm was coming up. We did mm -hmm. have Claymore mines all around the compound, and we had CS gas pellets on uh, rockets on top of the bunkers. And a one and a half volt charge, I believe, would set those off. You'd have a little clip thing, you'd have a wire protecting it, then you flip that around and you could push it and set off those Claymore mines or that CS gas. And if a storm came up, because sometimes lightning would hit those lines and set those Claymore mines off. It did several times while I was there. Yeah. I mean, everybody would come in. When you see a storm coming up, you came in. You did not stay out in the field because it was too dangerous. Those Claymore mines could be hit and be set off. And they did go off two or three times. I remember those large booms where they were set off. And one time, uh, our CS gas pellets got hit. And the wind was blowing back towards us, so the gas went out, came back in the compound, and we all had to get, grab our gas mask. But our little KPs and little women that would uh, do the wash for us and help us with the cooking, they didn't have any. And so they got gassed by this. It's like riot gas, and it burns your skin and your eyes and makes you cry and stuff. And they got all upset about that, so we had to get them gas masks. So we did. We got them gas masks. <laughs> with them not having the gas mask, what was what was the symptoms that they experienced or anybody experiences? Your skin, you know, burns and it gets in your eyes and you cry and it's just, it, it's like riot gas. It's the same gas that they throw out when people are rioting and stuff like to disperse the riots is what it is. Those poor ladies. And I'm sure, know. you know, they you were very, did... they were very angry. They got <laughs> on to their, to the guy that really managed them as our, our head cook. And they got all over him about it. So, yeah, he heard it. So he said, I got to get a gas mask for these ladies. Uh-oh, I've got to get these gas masks for them. <laughs> yeah, there was two or three, I think, that worked in the uh, in the mess hall with the cook. And, of course, we had the women that came and did our wash. We maybe had six or so that we would pick up in the morning and bring them, you know, from the village to help us do, you know. And you paid them to do the wash. And, of course, they got paid for helping the, the, the head cook. There was only one guy that was, and he would have them help him prepare our meals and stuff like that. Did you know how much, approximately how much they got paid? I don't, but if I, I'm trying to remember correctly if we paid them maybe like five or six bucks a month. That was a lot of money back then. I mean, this is in the 60s, so five or six bucks a month, I think, to do the wash. What do you think that that would be equivalent to now? Oh, gosh, I guess about 40 or 50 bucks a month or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that, a lot of money for them. I was going to say that probably went a very long way for their family. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to remember. I think it was something like that. And you wanted, I mean, you didn't have to have one. You could do your own wash, but I think, you know, I'd pay somebody to do it and like I was telling you that one time, the funny thing is during the rainy season, it was really hard to get anything dry. Everything was always damp. Everything was always wet. You couldn't get anything totally dry. Yeah. So you get your clothes washed and you put on these damp clothes in the, in the rainy season and it's just it's cold. Did you have access like going into Saigon to be able to buy new shoes? new clothes and if you did how no, often you were, you were issued boots and i think i used my boots the whole time i was there that was issued to me mm. and as far as socks everything was green too your underwear is green your socks are green everything's green 
Mm. Um, I don't remember buying any extra underwear, like t-shirts or green or stuff like that. I think whatever was issued lasted pretty much the whole time. Wow. But you could, I guess, when you went to, I'm trying to remember what the post exchange had. It was called Chillon. It was down in Chillon, Vietnam. Uh, I don't remember guys buying any extra clothing or anything like that. You got issued that. But if you did get extra, I think you had to pay for it. You had to buy it. But yeah. I don't remember getting any extra. One thing about the flares, and you mentioned the deer and rabbit would, you know, sometimes trip the uh, flares. Yeah. The flares. Um, did that ever draw attention to your location uh, by the enemy? No, because I knew who we were. We had that 300-foot microwave tower and and those other towers where you could uh, visualize things, you know, the guard towers and stuff like that. So, no, they knew who we were at. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, like I said, we would get rocked to disrupt communication. That was one of their main job was to discommunicate, you know, to disrupt communications if they could. So that's why they would lob those 122s in on us. Mm -hmm. And they really couldn't get near us, like I said, because we had uh, the elephant grass cut down and we weren't that far from the 199th Infantry Brigade and we weren't that far from the short range patrol group. There was the Lerps and the Slurps. Slurps were short range patrol the Lerps were long range patrol. The Slurps were army little groups that they would take out by helicopter, drop off. Their job was to find and um, engage the enemy. Find and engage the enemy, hit and then run. Come back to that spot, then the helicopter would pick them up and take them back. Long range patrol was just the opposite. They'd take guys out and they'd maybe be out for two or three days and hit the enemy, and then come back to a certain position, get picked up, and taken back to their camp. So that was one of the uh, ploys or whatnot that the Army used to intimidate the enemy was short-range patrol and long-range patrol. We call them lerps and slurps. I like those names, lerps and slurps. Yeah. <laughs> now, you also mentioned there, there was a time that off in the distance, you saw a large red bubble that formed and looked like a big mushroom cloud. Rightly so, you had thought it might have been an atomic bomb. As you were witness witnessing this, please tell us more about what happened in those moments. Well, I was on guard duty in the front tower, which was the shorter tower, which I can look down and the guard house is below. And off to the left of me is our little clubhouse. So you call it, it's almost like a little shack. It's a little shack that we converted into a clubhouse where we could have beer, a couple tables where you could play poker, and we had a turntable in there, and we had our we had a recorder in there where we played music, and we also had a couple parrots that we kept in there, and it was this place where we could meet, and we used to get movies. We got a hold of a, a projector, and we could show movies. We'd get a big sheet and put it up, and we could show movies. Well, I was on guard duty that night, and I'm looking down, and we had a picnic table out there, and some guys were out there drinking beer. It was pretty late in the morning, and these guys were probably working the late shifts. <coughs> it was two or three guys, if I remember correctly. And I happened to look out to the north, northeast or northwest. I forget where Benoit, Benoit was. Benoit was, we were between Benoit and Saigon. And Benoit was a very big air base. Very big air base. And I look towards Benoit and I see this big red bubble coming. I first think, oh my God, they dropped the atomic bomb. And I start to yell down at the guys for them to look over. And then the red bubble comes into a big mushroom cloud. And then the sonic boom hit us and shook the tower. And the guys, I looked down and they all dove to the ground because they think we're being hit, I guess, with the 122s. But what had happened was there was an attack on Benoit from the VC and they all had P-38s around their neck and that's a can opener for the sea ration can. It's called P-38. They were told, I guess, they were going to get all the food they wanted to eat because they didn't get a lot to eat. And they attacked Benoit and they hit the um, gasoline dump. 
I'd heard. I thought it was the ammo, but it was a gasoline dump. They hit it, and that's why this big red bubble came up and all this and blew up. But a lot of VC were killed, and they staved off the attack, but um, that's what had happened. But that sonic boom was so loud, it rocked, it broke everybody up, rocked mm -hmm. the whole place, and <laughs> scared us to death. <laughs> Now, I, I had wondered when you first told me about that, I was kind of imagining it, like trying to visualize that. And I thought it might have been something like the Agent Orange or something that was what caused it to have that color and go up like that. No, but it was the gasoline. It was the gasoline dump. And uh, we can imagine with all that gas and stuff being hit by a rocket or who knows, mortar or whatever they did to, to hit it, it just went up. Wow. And... I saw, and then the sun, the boom was just horrendous. I mean, it shook the tower mm. and woke everybody up the next day. But that was, I, I was not on that site when an ammo dump, not far from us, there's this big, there's these big mounds. And this is half mile or so from us. And they got hit at one time. And the sonic boom was so loud. Inside the comm center are these big steel beams. Well, it bent one of them. Just the boom itself mm. bent one of those uh, beams. That shows how powerful that was. I yes. was not there when that happened. But yes. that beam was still bent. <laughs> oh, wow. We kind of mentioned a little bit about the living conditions for you all there. Um, what were the living conditions that you saw? What were they like for those in the villages? Well, they were really tough. I mean, they were very poor people, so they built their huts or whatever whatever materials they could find. And some people were living out of there were these steel, uh, these uh, concrete coverts, these round things that you put under for you road to go over for water to go through. Sometimes they were living in those, or they were just lived anywhere they could. And they really liked living on the water because they for mobility and fishing and whatnot. But there were a lot of villages on that, but, you know, made out of bamboo and uh, whatever they could find. Yeah, to make the house, to make their house yeah, I showed you pictures of them. They just, any, anything that they could do. You had said that you all had actually moved the building over to your base. What, what was that like to move that building? How many people did it take to do it? I wasn't there when it happened, but the guys told me that they stole it from some other post. It was like a shack. They went over with uh, uh, a deuce and a half and put some chains around it and just drug it to the <laughs> site. And then I guess added on to it, drug it through, you know, it's, it's like a little shack. Like I said, it's not very big. Yeah. Uh, you could put a couple tables in there and we had a little bar in there and we had a uh, refrigerator in there to keep the beer. And like I said, we had a recorder in there to play music and there used to be a, uh, a little cage in there for a couple of parrots, but we had to get rid of that because guys would get drunk and throw darts at the parrots. Oh and no! A dart board and they would throw the darts at the parrots. So no. <laughs> so we had to get rid of that. And, oh uh, no! But uh, yeah, so it's just like a little bitty shack, but that was our clubhouse. You could go there. Sometimes we could get a projector and we could show movies in there. We could maybe get uh, maybe 15, 20 guys in there. I guess to watch the movie, something like that, if I remember correctly. It wasn't really big. No, you know, but I think that's just amazing that you guys, number one, the ingenuity and just the thought, hey, we can do something with this, and that you created your own clubhouse. And, uh, and also, you know, one thing you shared was that one time a girl band came from one of the villages and played at your club, and, and which I think is pretty cool. Um, can you share with us about Well, actually, they played. They didn't play in the club. They played in the little Quonset hut where we have our meals. It was bigger. It was bigger than the, the clubhouse. So the all-girl band came, and they played and, uh, the Vietnamese band. They were really good, and we had a lot of beer. We had a trailer with beer and ice in it so we could drink the beer and watch the girls play. And then after that, the guys went outside, and they threw some of the, the – NCOs and stuff like that into that water, into that ice water. I got pictures of that where we threw them in there. And that was a lot of fun. So 
Yeah, yeah. it was just, it was, I don't know how we or who got them, but somebody knew about this band and got them out there. They were really good. So we enjoyed that. That was really big entertainment for us. They, it may, may be a band that played around Saigon, you know, and uh, all girl band that got together, played around there. And somehow we were able to get them. I guess we paid them to come out and play for us. I think that's great. Which was I a big deal. Yeah. It was yeah. A lot of fun. Well, that's the only entertainment we had. The only other entertainment was what I told you was the donut dollies, the Red Cross girls. We called them donut dollies that came out and brought out games for us and bring us sometimes like cookies and stuff like that. So, that, that, and it was that, rare, but they came once in a while. I think that's great. I think that it's great that you guys were able to go into villages, the villages sometimes and go into Saigon, that you had the women that would come to your base and and be able to uh help wash the clothes and some you know cook they got to earn money and you got to have interaction with civilians and then that band i i think that that's great that you all were able to have connections with others uh, outside of your base unit yeah some guys learned a little vietnamese i didn't learn very much i mean you knew certain phrases and things like that but that was about it but uh yeah, it was, you needed their help to do certain things because you just couldn't do it all yourself. I mean, you can imagine a lot of units, you can't do your own wash and the cooks need help. And, and you're exactly right that you're helping them, you know, the, the, that group uh, getting paid to where they probably don't make much money anyway. So that was a lot of money to them and it was a, a form of uh, employment. I mean, there were a lot of Vietnamese that worked for a lot of the American forces groups. They did a bunch of them. Yeah, wow. That, that was, you know, an influx of money into their economy. Now, you also said that when you were able to go to Saigon, that you had to be careful about people approaching your truck. Please tell us wh why that was. Well, it was primarily in when you went to the villages to pick up the KPs and the women that would help uh, wash your clothes and things like that. Maybe you picked up uh, half a dozen or so people from that village uh, and the villages weren't, I think they were several miles from us, but we would drive a deuce and a half to the village. And the rule was nobody was to get close to the deuce and a half. So you had a driver and you had a guy riding shotgun and he actually, actually had a shotgun, a buckshot. And nobody was to come at near the deuce and a half, uh, primarily kids, because the VC had taught a lot of kids to uh, frag the deuce and a half. So that's that's uh, with a grenade, go just up like they're, you know, talk to them and drop a grenade in the deuce and a half or something like that. So they weren't supposed to get near it. And one time we had, I was driving, driving, and we had a guy driving, was riding shotgun. And a kid jumped up on the truck and he had to hit him with the butter off and knock him off. It seemed cruel, but you can't let them do that. He was, they knew they weren't supposed to do that. And the KPs quickly come out and get in the back of Doosap and you take off and you're doing 50 or 60 miles an hour down these dirt roads to get out of there because you never know where the VC are. I mean, they're everywhere. Right. And, um, well, same thing with Saigon. You just had to be careful. You had to be aware of your surroundings. Mm -hmm. And that's why I tell people, you know, a lot of, you're always keenly aware of your surroundings. And when you come home from Vietnam, it takes you, I will tell you, months to come down from that awareness of that high, from where you're looking over your shoulder, you're looking around, or you're aware. You don't have to do that anymore, but it takes time for that to wear off. Of it took me a long time to get rid of that to to your you know you just your senses are heightened and you're supposed to be aware of what's going on around you and when you come home you don't have to do that anymore yeah well, a lot of guys that was a problem i mean you know you, you all of a sudden you don't have to do that anymore i can imagine that it did take time and for everyone everyone's different and and again that kind of sometimes that can go into the idea of ptsd that you know but just even if you're okay and you're just trying to come down off of that definitely yeah. you're, you're it, trying to deprogram yourself deprogram yeah. yeah i mean like guys from i mean 
that went to Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, they're doing the same thing. Think yes. about it. They're there. And boy, your sense of awareness is heightened. You have to just look around. And when you come up, you don't have to do that anymore. You also mentioned, this goes back to your driving, learning to drive while you were in Vietnam that you hadn't ever driven before that time. Please tell us more and include what happened when one of the lieutenants told you to drive him somewhere. Well, when I got to Vietnam, I was 18. I had three birthdays there, my 19th, 20th, and 21st. I was 18 when I got to Vietnam and I'd never driven. Uh, I didn't have a driver's license and I really had never driven because, well, when I was at home and 17 and 18 years old, my dad was in Vietnam. He went to Vietnam when I was in the 11th grade. And in my senior year, he was gone the whole time. So it was just my mother, my three sisters and I at home, or my two sisters, one sister was married, but anyway, and she didn't have an opportunity to teach me to drive or do anything like that. She was too busy taking care of everything else. Mm -hmm. So when I got to Vietnam, I could not drive at all. And I had a Lieutenant when I got to uh, Long Bend receiver site, there was a lieutenant that was going into Saigon and he needed a driver. And he asked me to drive him to Saigon. And I told him that I couldn't drive. And he said, oh, it's nothing to it. I think if I remember correctly, the Jeep. So I drove him in that Jeep, which is a stick shift, which I'd never done before. And uh, I did go to Saigon with him, but I would turn corners so sharply, I nearly lost him one time. He nearly fell out of the Jeep. And when we got back, I had the brakes on the whole time, so I stripped the brakes, and <laughs> I never did drive him again, but when I was there, I did learn how to drive the Jeep, a three-quarter ton, and a deuce and a half. I could drive those, all those things like crazy when I left two years, two and a half, two years, two months later. I could drive any of those things. And, you know, I'm sure that by that time, that lieutenant, number one, he knew that you were learning to drive. But I also think that probably by that time, he was like, yeah, he, he, he's a good driver now. <laughs> now, I was scared to death in doing it because I didn't know how to do any of that stuff. Believe me, I was scared to death. And when we got back, we found that I had left the brakes on, like I said, the brake on, and stripped the brakes. So that had to go to the motor pool and get fixed. But I learned after that, like I said, how to drive all of those things. I drove them around the compound, got used to driving them. I could drive a deuce and a half. I drew that drove that to Saigon and around the three quarter ton, which was really helpful. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that, I think that that is really cool to get the different experience with the different kind of vehicles. You got it at a young age and, you know, for any driver, it's, it's good to have an all over experience of, of driving when you're the fundamentals, when you're first learning. Well, I did get that driver's license from him, and it says on there, I can drive all of those things, which I was amazed. I, I was happy to keep that. I'm looking at, yeah. <laughs> now, in Saigon, we talked about they, they had a specific vehicles that you saw all over Saigon that the people would drive. Um, what were they? Well, like little mopeds, I guess, and motorcycles. I mean, they had all those. They had tons of those, and bicycles, but mopeds, primarily little motorcycles that they would ride, and little taxis that would ride around. Uh, they were everywhere. You know, I've got a picture of Tudo Street, and it is jam-packed with most of the, the, if you saw a car, it was a little taxi, but most of them had mopeds, little mopeds or little motorbikes, and they were everywhere. When you saw, showed me the picture of that, that was pretty cool to see all that. And I remember, honestly, I remember, again, from Good Morning Vietnam, I remember seeing clips of that and then also seeing other pictures of Vietnam where you would see those in those pictures. Oh, yeah, they were everywhere. They were everywhere. Now, you shared that in the month of June, you all were rocketed a lot. What was that like? And did any of your comrades get hurt? No, that, I, you know, if I remember correctly, like I said, I believe it was June because they're on my birthday time. One particular month, they shelled us, seemed like every other day. I mean, you'd be embedded, you'd hear this loud thud and shake, and it really set shivers up your back. And what we were supposed to do was grab your mattress and flip over if it was close. 
if you could make it and get out of the barracks, you got got out and got into the bunker right next. That's why we built it. And sometimes even they would do it at night. We were watching a movie one night and we saw this huge flash and this loud thud and shake. And one of the rockets had hit outside the compound. So we all ran out of the, our little, the little uh, shack that we had that we call our little club down to the uh, bunker, got in the bunker. We waited a while. Then when it got silent, we went back and watched the rest of the movie. Mm. So, but a lot of times it was either early in the morning, like around six o'clock or it was in the evening, late in the evening, you know, just depend because we did have a big light on top of the tower. You had to have that because helicopters are flying all over the place all the time. Almost every night, all you hear is there's helicopters flying around. So we had to have a lot of lights on the tower for them yes. to see. So they could see that. Yes. And then you had mentioned that one time you were all ambushed. Uh, please tell us more about that time. 